And now, the only survival show to survive cramming ham with hamsters for eight hours. In this episode, we welcome back Daryl of FloridaHillbilly.com. We'll discuss the most loved and dreaded thing in preparedness, ham radio. And we'll get into why everyone should be hamming it up, plus other bad puns. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode 144. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole, safe and sound. Daryl, man, welcome back to the show. How you doing? It's been a while. It has been a long while, and like we were just saying before we started recording today, uh, man, we do we need to do this a lot more often. Good, absolutely. So now we're bringing you on today to talk about ham radio. And well, I hope just... so because that's really all I can talk about. I haven't had a garden in uh, close to a year now. I actually had to pay somebody to clean out the weeds. It's amazing how no, no frost and plenty of rain and water makes for uh, massive amounts of growth and things you don't want. Yes, so. that is very true. Um, I don't have any quail any longer, uh, as much as I love them. And, and it's on my list of things to, to start probably this fall because I really enjoyed the quail. The, the fast production time is just amazing what you can get. And uh, my wife likes the eggs. She likes to show up to social gatherings with these microscopic little uh, deviled eggs. And people are like, what are those? What are eggs? Really? What kind of bird is it? You'll never believe me. <laughs> uh, my wife has actually embraced the, 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 the homesteading thing finally. Has she really? She has. She, she's actually, uh, well, she's always been interested in, in the self-reliance part. Uh, after the, the second hurricane, and, and I, she saw how I had changed the way we lived in, le- in less than a month, she saw that there was definitely a, uh, uh, a good reason to be prepared, as much as I hate to use the phrase. Yeah. Um, and, and it's been seven, eight years since our last hurricane, so we're probably due. Yeah. I jinx myself, but. But uh, I don't have uh, I don't have rabbits. Oh no! That's, excuse me. I don't. I have rabbits, but I don't have uh, a, a lot of production right now. I'm kind of in a holding pattern. I haven't done any harvesting in rabbits in uh, about three months. I've got a batch that are that are waiting to go to freezer camp, but I just haven't uh, haven't done anything with it. Uh, my biggest push lately has been, unfortunately, real work and uh, ham radio. That brings us to ham and probably the the part that people have the hardest time with around ham which is once they get past the dry parts they they find the meaty juicy parts there are meaty juicy parts i'm as, i'm i'm waiting for the meaty juicy parts i keep being well, told actually, by the there are there, there are some interesting things uh, yes having access to being in part of the aries group and having access to the eoc i get to see what happens behind the scenes when things go bad locally mm-hmm. and it's amazing what they have at their disposal at just at the local level, the, the county sheriffs they have. There's a tank at the local EOC, an armored tank. It's like, awesome. Like a tank that goes boom? Like a tank that goes boom. I'm afraid to ask why the sheriff's department has that. It was donated. It was it was military surplus. Oh. And and I think I think they paid something like eight hundred dollars for it. And then they never use it, but it's got the, the local county insignia on it. It's used in, in the event that there's some sort of mass shooting and there's injured people, they can use this because it's, it's got about three foot of clearance and tank treads and it's all armored. They can drive over top of who's ever injured and pick them up through the hatch in the bottom and carry them away. That's the story I was told. Yeah, it's the part that, that might it goes... Just be an ego trip for the sheriff, but... Uh, yeah, I think so. It's the part that it also goes boom, which I wonder if they were given the ammunition, the shells oh. for it. I don't know. I didn't get that information, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I get to see that the EOC has something like 10,000 gallons of diesel to run their two generators wow. and they have like a month's worth of, of supplies to keep things running, uh-huh. uh, being under the, under the shadow of the, the nuclear power plant. They have uh, Geiger counters. They have iodine tablets all stockpiled. Uh-huh. It's nice to know that while I usually consider most government officials to be some level of inept at uh, handling their day-to-day jobs, they are at least looking forward to the, to the possibility. Even some of our local governments are preppers, whether they want to say it or not. Yeah. So I like that. So that's some of the meaty parts of it that are out there if you really want to dig into it. Okay. And I think 
for me, getting started and getting past those dry parts was the hardest part. So take us back to where you got started with it. Now, before we hear the answer to that, a quick message. Help us keep the lights on. Support the ITRH show and mission by becoming part of the Roving Horde Armada. You can learn more at ITRH.net about all the great benefits membership gets you. Things like access to episodes the Sunday night before they air publicly, encrypted forms to connect with like-minded people privately, access to every episode ever produced by ITRH, including a special one that was never aired, a free copy of the book, Owning Your Survival, Nine Steps to Surviving, Survival and Preparedness, access to a one-hour emergency kits for bugging out and bugging in class with special downloads, just to name a few. Again, visit itrh.net for more details now. We're counting on supporting members just like you to help us keep the lights on and the mics hot. And we've got something special for listeners today. Today's episode is brought to you by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash in the rabbit hole. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or any other MP3 player. I know I've become a huge fan of Audible. It's helped me chew through a lot of the books and research I have to do through the show and a lot of just really great zombie books out there. So again, check out www audibletrial.com slash in the rabbit hole to get your free audiobook download and 30-day free trial. Now, back to Daryl from floridahillbilly.com on how he got started in ham. I got my, my tech license in uh, 2013, Christmas Eve, and I went to field day in June of 2014 and I had studied up and passed my general, and I told myself all I wanted was the HF privileges with the general license, and I'll just go with that. I don't need the extra. There's, the test is a bear. I got no interest in it. Mm -hmm. And sat down at field day, and I operated the uh, GOTA station, Get on the Air. It's uh, the newbie station. Uh, for like 17 hours, I was in there just having a ball, contesting on HF, uh, high, high frequency, the, the long-distance radio, mm -hmm. uh, is very much like hunting. It's uh, sitting in the air conditioning with a nice tall glass of iced tea and a set of headphones on and you're hunting. You're trying to get that guy that's piled up in there and, and I, I really enjoyed it. And by the end of the field day, I decided, you know what, I'll give myself a year and I'll get my extra license. And I realized about a month and a half ago that field day is right around the corner. I need to really start getting this done if I'm going to get this, you know, if I'm going to get this license, I'm going to live up to my goal. I took the test four or five times and it was so bad they use a um, it's a multi multi uh, multiple choice test mm -hmm. they have a, a key overlay to check it and they pass it to three people each person verifies the answers and the overlay has got a little holes punch in it and that's where the right answer is supposed to be and i watched the second time i took the test i watched the guy lay the key down and he adjusted it and he lifted it up and set it down again and he looked at the guy next to him and said is this the right key i had missed that many questions so, mm. so I made friends with uh, a woman who passed her tech license with me, and her next door neighbor happens to be John Amadeo, the producer for Last Man Standing, um, the Tim Allen Friday Night Show. Not to give them a, a, a plug, but it's a great show. Uh, Tim Allen apparently is one of us. Hmm. He likes to be prepared. He has his own um, emergency plan for his family, his location, and whatnot. But John's parents lived next door to this other ham operator. And I became, you know, like, like I said, I became friends with her, helped her out. And so my friend, my friend's name is Nancy. She passed her test the same time I did. Our call signs were actually two letters off from each other. Uh, she's a retired school teacher from New York and wasn't very technical. And her next door neighbor happened to be, they had passed away and their son was John Amadeo. The last man standing, the TV show with Tim Allen. Mm -hmm. And he had set her up with radio equipment so that she could talk with him in case of an emergency so he she would be able to tell him what's going on with this property there and when she would have technical issues she'd give me a call so in the scheme of things i became her surrogate uh handyman electronically and i would be john's hands to fix things over there 
And uh, John actually told me that on the crew of the show, he uh, gave some various incentives, is how he put it, for them to all get licensed. And he said that he took people who are not technical in any way, administrative assistants in Hollywood, and showed them how to basically study for the test and pass it. He said, take the answer, take the questions that are all published, take the answers, and just read the question, the answer, question, answer, nothing else. Don't worry about the three wrong ones that are, that are, that are offered, because uh, I don't know if everybody knows or not, the ham test itself, depending on which pool you're looking at, the, the uh, technician, which is the first step, general, or the, uh, the extra, there, all the questions are published, and the answers are also published. So basically, all you have to do is memorize. And I tell folks that I'm the worst type of ham. I'm the guy that memorized the answers, and I don't actually know what I'm, what I'm actually doing and how the, the technology behind it works. Yes. But I pass the test. And every day that I turn the radio on, I learn something. Mm-hmm. And that's, that was one of the first things that I learned when I started studying was your technician license allows you the freedom to start learning. So back to field day, at the end of field day, I realized I can do this. I can, I can go ahead and study for the extra. I'll give myself a year. Next field day, I'll do it. And studied, studied, studied at the very last minute. And on field day this year, that morning, I passed my test finally. I actually only missed five of the 50 questions. Oh, nice. So I, got 40, I got 45 right. I went from getting like 15, 16 right. I used uh, John Amadeo's advice and just crammed and crammed. I've got formulas and letters and frequencies running into my head now that put me to sleep if I thought about it. It's, <laughs> it is it's dry information. But yes. I am now an extra. And uh, I am now Kilo Whiskey 4 Lima Golf. Uh, it's so new to me, I still have to stumble over it. But uh, the ham radio thing is... There are so many places you can go with it. Uh, you can do, of course, your local repeater work. You can pick up a, a $30 radio off Amazon and you know, the, the little bow fangs that work just as well as the $500 radios, minus some bells and whistles. But functionality-wise, it's, it's basically a disposable radio. You drop it and break it. You don't cry like a little girl because you just threw away $500. You just get another one. Circling back to the test for a minute, that's hysterical that that is the exact same way Jason and I ended up getting our technician's license. And it was part of part of my reason for bringing you on today, because we got it and we both walked out and we're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I know I just passed and I'm about to get my license, but I should not be allowed on the air. I'm right there with you. It, the way they have it set up is kind of ridiculous. They want you to know about frequencies and AC, DC, and all the stuff that, let's face it, if you have that question when you go to turn your radio on, you're not just going to try to guess. You're going to look it up. Mm-hmm. Odds are, in my case, and, and just about everybody else's uh, ham shack, they call them, that I've seen, the radio is right next to a computer. Yes. I can almost guarantee you every computer that's next to a radio is hooked to the internet. If you have a question, look it up. So I know that in the state of, here in the state of Florida, a lot of the contractors tests, they allow you to have an open book. In my opinion, it's not about knowing this stuff because all you're doing is memorizing it. So I don't know what the right answer is, but there should be some sort of mentorship, uh, mandatory hands-on lessons, maybe a, maybe a hands-on applied test, test to see how you, if you know how to do things. I don't know that I would want them to put more barriers in the way, though. But well, just change them. Yeah, it's, it is frustrating. And I know this, it varies a little depending on the area, but like here in Houston, the guys that do the stuff here in Houston, they're good guys and they're, they try, but they hold the classes at weird times. They don't keep their website up to date. It's always under construction. They're always redoing it. And so it becomes this real hassle to try to even get to the class or even try to get to the test. And I think Jason was the one that finally found somebody that did what you were talking about. And we literally sat in a room for eight hours straight and read the question, read the right answer. And then at the end of the eight hours, we took the test. Actually, we took, uh, we were like, I took the technician and immediately they were like, okay, you passed. Do you want to take the general? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I I almost passed it. But I was really? like, you know, I shouldn't. I was like, it's not that I shouldn't, but I don't, I don't even know what I'm doing with the technician. So, right. and I think, and you had shared some really great resources with me a long time ago, which we'll get to in a little while, but it does become very frustrating in the way that it's structured. 
to kind of venture off that and for people that maybe really aren't that familiar with ham they've heard about it i think at some point we've all heard about ham especially if they're you're into preparedness whether new or old so but let's let's back up and talk about why is ham better than old-fashioned radios Uh, i mean the the walkie talkies don't they get something like 25 miles i mean that's what the package says yeah i'm sure they do if you're standing on top of a building and the the guy you're talking to is 25 miles away on top of a, a A mountain and the humidity's um, perfect and the yeah, weather's perfect propagation is the word you should know that you've got your license now <laughs> again see i should not be allowed on the air right and, and, and the only reason i know it's because i'm a member of four of the local um ham groups and that's uh, i don't i prefer some of the groups over others mm-hmm. like all social entities uh you'll find certain groups just mesh better than others yeah and, and back to what you were saying with you you have guys that are the odd hours and and uh, websites that don't work. Let's face it, ham radio is an old technology. Yeah, most of the hams are older than you and I. Yes, uh, and, and not by a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they have a thing called silent key. That's when a ham operator dies. There are more silent keys, I believe, in my area. Well, this is, I'm also in South Florida, so we're we're full of uh, folks. Uh, what what was the the term I heard? God's waiting room. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> So we have a lot, a lot of older folks here. But to get with, if you get with some folks that are the industry, you know, or the the hobby, I should say, I've not found anybody that's not at least trying to be helpful. Mm-hmm. How they deliver the information may or may not jive with the way you want to learn it, but they're at least trying to get you into it. To be honest, my time has been so short lately. There's a uh, there's one seat in the house where I get some privacy. And uh, I have all my study materials actually on a phone. I'm, a, I'm an Android man. Take the uh, study material on your Android phone to that uh, certain porcelain seat in the house when you have a you know, little bit of free time where no one's going to bother you. And that's where I did most of my studying. Mm-hmm. And that's it. The test material itself is super dry. And when I passed my technician's license, I'd only study for two weeks. If you've got a computer background, the jump into ham radio is not huge. From my standpoint, it was, uh, I took my first test cold. And I got 21 right as a practice test. And you need to score 26 out of 35. So I was almost there. Finished my test. And the guy who congratulated me, he says, you know, the first step that you're supposed to do now that you're an operator, you know, a legal operator, is to build your first radio. I said, uh, no, thanks. I've already, I've already bought one. I'm just going to be an appliance operator. Because mm. that's really all they are. With uh, the test cost $15. All the other information is free. So effectively, you've got $30 in a radio, $15 for the test itself, if you can pass it the first time and you're on the air. As far as how you operate, that's where the local groups are handy. Mm-hmm. I listen to, it's called a net. Uh, the local folks have a predetermined time when they all check in. One, one person is the net control. He takes in the call signs. He you know, jots them down and he basically is the referee for uh, a round table gab session. I won't lie to you. A lot of it's, oh yeah, we went to this this place and had early bird dinner and my grandkids are coming to visit us next week and and uh, weather's been great and I hope to mow my lawn tomorrow. A lot of it's not necessarily interesting, mm-hmm. but it's social interaction and it teaches you how to use the radio without getting yourself in trouble. So why do you find, because ham is such a dry topic to study and a lot of people associate it with, let's face it, some some extremely geeky people that maybe they wouldn't necessarily normally see themselves cottoning to. Why do you find it so enjoyable? Uh, well, for two reasons. Uh, one is the contesting. The HF stuff, I can turn my radio on, and my wife is extremely limiting in what I can have for antennas. I have a single wire runs from the peak of my roof to a tree. It's 43 foot long. Um, I'm running 100 watts of power through that, and I can talk to anybody in the world. I've talked to every continent except for Antarctica, and that's just a population issue. So that, yeah. and, and to be able to, to try to talk to somebody, and, and really all I do is get a signal report. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Here's your report. And, and it's a little more complex than that, but for simplicity's sake, it's, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Have a nice day. That's, that's it. Just getting that sounds boring, but when you're sitting there at three in the morning and you're trying to talk to Australia and you get through finally, there's a, sem- uh, there's a sense of accomplishment. You're like, oh my gosh, I can do this. Mm-hmm. The other side, from the preparedness standpoint, I work on the road. 
I'm away from home all the time. I don't have TV service. I listen to podcasts uh, of various sorts from time to time. I almost listen to no radio. I have no direct interaction with news sources. So if something happens, sadly, I don't know about it. There have been many times when I'll have a customer come up to me like, are you going to be much longer? You know, we've got a tropical storm coming. I'm like, oh, really? That'll explain the clouds. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. And yeah. if something happens and I'm away from home and, heaven forbid, power goes out, cell, cell service goes out. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but for a $45 investment, I'm ready to be able to get a hold of my wife if I need to. With a technician level license and a repeater system, we have a, a very good one down here. I can get about 45 or 50 miles from the outside edge to the repeater and then back to the far side of that, wherever that repeater is. So from where I'm located, I can get anywhere in my normal work area back to my wife without a whole lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and there is actually an emergency network of ham operators, which I should know the name of. Again, this points to how bad I am at all of this. There are two of them that, that are local to us. One is called Aries and one is called Racy's. Let's see if I can get this. It's Amateur Radio Emergency Services and Radio Amateur. I don't remember what the other one is. Aries is the big one. Yeah. And basically, we, we have a practice net once a month where everybody gets on the air and checks out. And if there's anything going on with, uh, we also do Skywarn, which is weather spotting. We do that over the radio. And that works in conjunction with the NOAA. But the Aries folks actually have line badges to get into our, our local EOCs in the event of some sort of catastrophe. We have a person that's stationed at all of the emergency shelters around with a ham radio. Um, we've done, uh, we, we're in the shadow here of a nuclear power plant. It's seven miles from my house, I believe. And if something happens with that, we're, you know, we're also deployed. We have a means of communicating outside the area should uh, an EMP or you know, the, the internet, whatever goes down that, that causes communications to drop. Uh, we can still get word out. And that's, that's the biggest excitement for me. If you can have a radio, and 12 volts of power, you can talk anywhere in the world if you know what you're doing. It's interesting. That's one of the things that Jason and I have talked about a lot recently, and what was finally got us off our butts to really hammer down and try to figure out about ham. Because he's a good mm, 15 miles away from me, I think, maybe okay. maybe 20. And you know, I think we've all, we've all experienced it at some point, or I think most people have, where the cell phone network just goes down. You have no cell signal. You're not getting out uh, because of an emergency going on. Uh, in Houston, most of the time, it's often like hurricanes and people calling each other, trying to find out, you know, are you okay right. and stuff like that. 9-11, it was, it was a different situation. It was that coupled with, I think the government was actually limiting it because they were, for various reasons, not nothing nefarious, but, uh, or at least I don't think it was anything nefarious going on. But anyway, that's a uh, conspiracy theory for another it day. It was a precursor to the Jade Helm operation. Well, yeah, we got to talk about Jade Helm. <laughs> uh, they're, they're coming in my door right now. Who am I? Alex Jones. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> that guy. But anyway, so that communication in the military, it's move, shoot, communicate. It's There's a reason that communication is in that trifecta there. It's so important. We have to be able to... A, get news, and B, share news by connecting with the people that we care about and the people that care about us. Or if you're in a, a some sort of prepper community or, or even like with Jason and Jonathan and I, where it's a, a small network of, of support that we're actually working on expanding here with the roving horde armada, to be <laughs> able to connect with each other and share plans and say, I'm going here, where are you going? Or to coordinate an effort and things like that. A good friend of mine, uh, he and his wife run the uh, wannabe homesteaders. He's a, a Marine, and not to talk bad about Marines, but he's a little thick uh, <laughs> in, in the argument I, I, I keep having with him. He won't, he absolutely will not get his license. He says, if I need to use a radio in an emergency, I'll just pick it up and use it. And that's the FCC is in an emergency, they say, do whatever you have to to get, if life or loss of property is, is imminent, you do whatever you have to do, and that's fine. And then I hand him my radio and I say, here. Go to, the, go to uh, the two meter band and run SSB and contact me via simplex. And he's like, uh, right. I'll go back to your tech license allows you to start to learn. Mm -hmm. And how do you get better at this? You practice. Do I want to know that, that a, a guy three blocks away from me is going to cut his lawn tomorrow? No. Do I want to practice using my radio so I make sure that if I have a problem, I can figure it out now when there's no pressure? Yeah. Practice makes perfect. 
And yeah. the only way to practice legally is with that license. Yeah. And I think it's like anything, whether it's firearms or any kind of preparedness thing. It's like anything in life. You, you, you want to know how to use something before you have to use something. Right. Absolutely. Let's dive in because we've thrown out a little bit about the different levels. For the listeners, what are the different levels and what do they mean? The three active licenses you can pick up now, they've changed it over the years. There are a bunch of them and I'm not familiar with the others because I'm the new guy. I, yeah, I'm 45. I'm young if I'm a ham. Yeah. Excuse me, 46 now. But I'm, I'm a young ham. I'm like half the age of some of these guys. The three levels are technician, which gives you VHF, UHF, which is local uh, repeater work and direct contact. Call it a CB on steroids. It's very much like the CB. on. It's a little different frequency. The, the radio that you use on a boat is usually VHF or UHF. Those are the types of things that the technician license. You have some access to a little tiny sliver of the high frequency stuff, the distant stuff, but that requires uh, CW capability. You have to know Morse code. That's the one nice thing. That was the thing that tipped me over into getting my license is there's no longer a requirement to know Morse code. So while I cannot transmit Morse code effectively myself, there are plenty of programs that allow me to if I wanted to. So that's technician. Technician is basically get in, get started, learn how the protocols on, on making a contact and using your radio and your equipment and making local use of repeaters and the technology. And again, the, the lovely part about this is ham radio is not a service. It is just physics. It just works. Unless the laws of physics change, if the world ends, as long as you can get 12 volts of power somehow, you can make that radio work. The next step is general, and to me, that's the big one. That's the sweet spot. If you can get to general, and you should, Aaron, and then we can talk <laughs> without using Skype. Yes. The general gives you HF privileges. Probably, let's see, I'm looking at my band chart right here. I would say almost 90% of, of all the frequencies and, and ranges that you can use with all privileges you can get with the general. You, you have access through all the UHF and VHF and then all the way up from 10 meters down to 160 meters, which doesn't mean much to the listeners. Let's just say that different bands work better at different times of day and different times of year, and you'll learn that as you go. Again, it's always been a learning thing, and that's one of the things I like is I learn all the time with this. The extra to me is the, uh, the high occupancy lane on the interstate. You know, those, the lane that only you know, certain people that have enough people in their cars, they can get the, less, there's less traffic there so they can go a little faster. That's the extra to me. Uh, it adds a little bit of extra, literally extra bandwidth frequency area that you're allowed to use. In my opinion, the extra is uh, it's almost a showboat license. You've got nothing else to do, so you study for your extra. I did it mostly as a personal challenge and partly because I kept hearing those guys that are just two or three kilohertz off of where I was able to transmit and I could hear them clear as day and I wasn't allowed to talk to them. It's hunting. It's, it's, uh, yes. You've got that extra 100 acres next door to you that you're not allowed to hunt on without the license. So I just went ahead and got the license. But again, even if you just get your tech license, I'm, I'm pushing my wife and kids. I told them, I said, I'll give you $100 cash and your own radio if you just pass the test. <laughs> I mean, that's, I don't care if you never use it. If, as long as you have the license and you know how, uh, that's fine with me. So far, I've had no takers. <laughs> I did that with Jen and her concealed handgun license, and it didn't work until she was finally not in a hairy situation, but in an area of town that could have turned into a hairy situation very easily uh, and was in that on a regular basis, walking to and from medical school. And then she finally did it after five me years of me saying, I will get you training with the best guy in town. It will not be me that does it. I will give you the cash for the gun. No straw man purchases here. And, uh, and I will, uh, I'll pay for your CHL class. And, and after years of not pushing her, but just reminding her, she finally did it. So I hope that uh, your daughters and wife, uh, I hope that works out for you too. Well, and sadly, you've pointed out the fatal flaw of my plan. I actually work part-time at a gun shop here. Uh, <laughs> I've been around guns my entire life, basically, mm -hmm. uh, all of my adult life, and I don't have my concealed weapons permit. And as a veteran, all I have to do is just fill out the paperwork and go down and go through the process, and I just haven't. Oh, man. Isn't that horrible? That's horrible. I'll tell you what. I'll push you to become a general if you push me to become a, a concealed weapons carrier. How's that? Deal. You have a deal. <laughs> One of the big issues Jason and I are now having is, okay, we have our technician's license. What do we go buy? 
what radio do we go get? Should we get a, a handset? Should we get a car kit? Should we get a, you know, one of the bigger things that, that is a stationary unit? What are, what are the differences in there with those things? Well, let me, let me clarify. You have HTs, which are handy talkies. That's the, the, the low handhelds. Mm -hmm. You have a mobile, which is typically mounted into like a vehicle of some sort. You have portable, which becomes a, a uh, kind of like the tricorder on Star Trek that are used for, it's a little bigger, a little better than the HTs, but offer a little more bells and whistles. And then there's the base station. Uh, and which should you get? My answer would be yes, all of them. <laughs> uh, sitting here, I, I see a half dozen radios, uh, and that's not counting the ones that are in my vehicles, in my bags, or just stored in the back room that I haven't gone through yet. It's, you know how you, you are with flashlights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should be lightweight with radios as well. See, that's my biggest fear. But the, the nice thing is, is you can go with something as, as simple as the little Baofangs. Mm -hmm. They're Chinese radios. They're a little clunky to program, but there's a program called Chirp. It's free. And once you get it set up, it's basically point and click and your radio is programmed to your local repeaters. And at that point, you're good to go. You can start as cheap as that. That's the $30 radio. You can go to some of the higher end radios and spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Money that I, if I had, I wouldn't spend on a radio. Mm -hmm. I'm a big Yesu fan. I've got an 857. It's an all band radio. It does UHF, VHF. It does VHF stuff. That's what I use. It's actually considered a mobile radio. It's normally installed in a car of some sort, but I use it as my base station. It's big enough. Then I have two 817s, which are, they call them QRP rigs. QRP is the, the Q code for low power. It's only a five watt radio, but it's made for like climbing up to the top of a mountain and making contacts. It's also all bands, all modes. It's UHF, VHF, HF. And that's what I want to have actually installed in my car. Unless I install my THF6A Kenwood, which I really like. That's probably, in my opinion, if you only get your tech license, that is the radio to strive for uh, or something along the same lines as that. The THF6A uh, by, made by Kenwood is a UHF VHF transmit full band receive. So you're able to listen to the sideband stuff uh, without being able to talk. It allows you to listen and, and let's face it, in an emergency situation, depending on what's going on, if, if you're trying to get across the state and not let anybody know what, where you are and the world's coming to an end, you're going to want to listen. You're probably not going to want to talk to many people. And that to me is probably the best radio to have as a first HT. Yesu makes a, one as well. I just happened on this one. Couldn't really tell you why I chose that one over any other. I like the form factor. It's actually smaller than a deck of cards, a little thicker, but smaller than a deck of cards, and does just about everything you could possibly want as a portable radio, short of you know, talking to China from your backyard. Nice. So I, I really I can't, I can't speak highly enough about the, that, uh, again, the Kenwood THF6A. So I, actually, I have two of them. Keep telling two. my wife, I'm like, well, this one's for you. But I don't have a license yet. <laughs> then you need to get it because I've got, I've got this one for you and I've got the 817 for you as well. Baby, I've spent the money. You got to hurry up and do this. You have to take the test now. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. She's actually studied a bit. She understands that with me on the road, this is going to be the best way to in touch with me in, in an event of something going on. Mm -hmm. And I usually have the radio on all the time. It works when the cell phone doesn't necessarily work. Mm -hmm. So, and I like that. The way the repeater systems work, uh, you have a tower with a radio on it. It receives your transmission, shifts it 600 kilohertz, and then, well, it depends on, on the system, I suppose. It shifts it off to another frequency close by and then retransmits it. So as I'm pushing talk, everybody else is hearing on a little different frequency, and the radios are set up for that. So if you look at a, uh, a repeater tower as a tree, uh, uh, like a maypole, and you have a line out is to like 25 miles and you draw a circle all the way out. If you're on, if you're within that circle, if you can hit that repeater as far away as you are off one side, somebody on the other side should be able to hear you. So w what the repeaters do is they ex extend your range. The simplex, if you go simplex, simplex is, is direct radio to radio. It doesn't ha give you the range, uh, but it also allows you to be a little more discreet the things that you'll learn as a technician as you start to use your radio are the common ways that radios are used. 
And what that also means is what is not a common use, you can use to get around someone possibly listening in on you. I see that. Now, that was going to be my next question. I'll, I'll <laughs> get with you in because, a minute. Because it's, it's basically radio waves are, are party lines. Yeah. If I'm hitting transmit, everybody that's on that frequency can hear me. Yeah. So you go to a frequency or a, a mode that people don't normally use. For instance, you go to 20 meters is usually upper sideband. If you consider the radio frequency, the, the radio waves as you're transmitting a, a highway, a divided highway, you've got the line down the middle and you've got the upper and lower side of the road. Typically what you do to save power is you go down the middle and off one side, the upper side band, and then the lower side band is not used at all. So nobody's monitoring the traffic on that other, that other side. So if you do your, all your transmitting and talking on the other side, odds are nobody will hear you unless they're, you're doing a whole bunch of chattering. Mm. So, Yeah, because that was one of the things that I was a little, and I could be wrong about this. I, I could be wrong. Re- probably wrong about everything to do with ham since you know all i did was cram for the test (laughs) but again i'm not much further ahead of you i'm just going on what i've what i've seen in practice so yeah i'm I'm giving misinformation as well awesome awesome as long as we're giving out misinformation today someone i can promise you if anybody hears it they will correct us that's the joy of the internet yes and and ham radio in general and oh yeah. yeah oh yeah oh yeah but so one of the things I came across was that you can't encrypt your conversations. You cannot. You know, we're preppers, so we're, we're a little paranoid. Yes, and we are. We, we want to encrypt things. Uh, yes, not that we think that's going to solve all of our problems. <clears throat> but, you know, we would like to have some OPSEC. And so I guess the answer is to go down into some, some frequencies that, that aren't commonly used. Correct. That's, and that's where you have to go. With the programmable radios, depending on what they give you, can give you a range that you're still within your legal transmit range. Mm -hmm. Using two meters, which is a common frequency for local communication that you can use on your technician license, not many people use single sideband on that. They break down the signal into uh, smaller segments, and it works fairly well. You get a little, because it's, you're using less of the bandwidth, you use less power, so you can get a little more distance out of it. And that's an option. Uh, but let's face it, if, uh, if the world ends, FCC is not going to really care if you encrypt or not. Yeah, they have bigger bigger fish to fry than right. than right. Uh, than that. You know, they've got to deal with the Godzilla zombies or or, or whatever they're dealing with that day. Jade, Jade Helm uh, yes. is going to, yes, them. And so that's interesting, you know, and that reminds me of something. And it's been a long time since I've read it, but I remember in Rawls's book, there was something about like cutting crystals to do a weird frequency thing. Yes. And I don't remember if it was legal or not. Do you remember that? I remember that, but I read it before I was a ham. So I wasn't real up to date on what it was. Yeah, that was uh, kind of what I read it. And I was like, I don't understand. That sounds interesting, but I don't understand what he's talking about here. So I was the, just curious. if The problem becomes that if you do it to my radio and I'm trying to talk to you, we also have to do it to your radio. Right. So whatever type of either physical modifications or software modifications are made have to be done to both radios so they can still talk the same the same frequency and or mode but uh, th- there are some really interesting things you can do there's there, it's called uh, n beams n b e m s i believe and i'm not sure what the acronym is, stands for but you can take one of these $30 radios and a cell phone with a, a bit of free software and take an excel spreadsheet and convert it into what amounts to old modem tones and do an, it's called an acoustic connection. Mm-hmm. Phone is transmitting these squawky sounds next to the radio that has the transmit button hit. And you're literally transmitting these squirrely sounds to somebody else's radio that has the software that's listening to it. And you can transmit documents that way. Oh, that's interesting. And that's kind of like the old thing where, and I cannot think of the name of it, where two people have the same book. Uh, yes. The same edition of the same book, and it's yes. basically go to this page on this this sentence and this word. Yes. Yes. And, and that's not encryption, but it's obscure enough that if they're not set up for it or recording, they'll never get what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you can have an encrypted zip file and send that. How does that work? Because hmm. the data itself isn't encrypted. It's the content. Hmm. I don't know. I have to look into that. Hmm. It's a good question. Sneaky, sneaky, and something but, we'll have uh, to revisit. The acoustic coupling is just amazing to me because a cheap Android phone that's got this, soft, again, free software 
and the $30 radio and I can transmit pictures, Word documents, whatever I want to someone else that's set up with the same stuff. That's pretty cool. But, but when I, I tell you this, if you haven't heard of this, it's, it's actually really cool. Another thing you can do with your technician's license is take certain modifiable home Wi-Fi routers. Uh, there are various uh, uh, Linksys routers that are applicable that are Part 15 compliant. Part 15, FCC Part 15 is a set of guidelines that regulate how they're used and what they can do and what they can't do. Well, some of these wireless routers use the same frequencies that are under the, the control of FCC Part 97, which means with your technician's license, you can modify your Wi-Fi router to create a ham radio network. They call them ham mesh. Mm -hmm. And instead of getting across your house with your radio, because you can add on antennas and boost up the power because you're now f Part 97 compliant, something you're not allowed to do with Part 15 compliance, you know, the average guy without a license, mm -hmm. you're allowed to create mesh networks that are covering cities. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. So with a couple stops between your house and Jason's, you set a couple of these up on high spots, you can have a private network that's broadcast over ham bands that unless somebody else has got your frequency figured out, it's effectively a private network that's covering miles, not feet. Nice. So ham mesh is something that's really, really interesting. Again, you're not allowed to encrypt. And typically what happens is you set your broadcast ID up as your call sign. But if you were to shift the broadcast ID to something other than the standard, still include your call sign, of course. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to have this network that someone would have to go actively seeking to find. Well, and you could use, you could layer these approaches, like the thing you were talking about a minute ago with the spreadsheet that I've already forgotten the name of. Uh, you could <laughs> layer means. that, yeah create a mesh network and do that with the mesh network. And, and now you've really buried something deep. The thing is, there are multiple ways of doing things with the ham license that I still run across stuff every day. I'm like, what's this? I didn't know you could do that. Really? <laughs> I'm allowed to do this? Oh, I got to get one of those. Yeah. I will send you some information in regards to end beams because it's, that's one of those things that everybody should have in their bag of tricks yeah who needs a fax machine exactly who still who still has a fax machine <laughs> you know what i get i get that every once in a while a customer's like can you just fax it i'm like am i on candid camera what is this <laughs> this thing still work who's got a landline yes for people that are interested in this and have finally gotten hooked on the idea of doing it because i remember you shared some great resources with me a while back if somebody wants to get into this start studying studying start getting connected to local groups so that they can do this how do how do people go about doing that the first resource that i would go to is arrl.org that's the amateur radio relay league they're the nra for ham radio okay that's the easiest way of putting it mm -hmm. and they've got all the resources you could possibly want depending on the path you want to take for your education uh, you can buy a book there are several folks that swear by various flavors of this this class or this class they all work depending on how much you want to put into them if you want to do the memorize the question and answer path that you and i took if you go on android android's got multiple free applications i think there's some for iphones too i'm sure there are but yeah. to paraphrase no self-respecting prepper would ever use an iphone <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll come back to that off air. <laughs> ARRL.org, okay. Uh, they've got all kinds of things. They always want to push you to, to sign up to become a member because they're the lobbyists for our rights. And it's actually, like the NRA, in my opinion, it's one of the ones that's worthy of taking my money. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I'll actually give them the money. They keep sending me stuff, and I'm like, nah. It's, it's amazing how many folks want the bandwidth that the ham radio operators use. Really? The FCC wants to chunk it up and sell it. Ah. Uh, you paid $15 for your test. I paid $15 for my test. Let's say that, that in a perfect world, you took the test three times, got your three licenses. So you're, you're looking at $45 you've spent on testing. That's all ARRL money. Mm -hmm. um, the FCC doesn't get any of that. There, oh. there, is, no, there is no money that, that is made from the S, by the government from amateur radios. Okay. Now, when they sell a slice of bandwidth to ABC, mm -hmm. you can guarantee that 
someone's ponying up some money somewhere. Mm -hmm. Whenever the the uh, FCC gets a, a, a stick in their craw and wants to try to bust up the amateur radio guys' available bandwidth, the ARRL steps up and says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And they prove why. Katrina and Line 11, multiple times down here south of the hurricanes, all of these have proven the use of the ham radio to try to get communications in and out of places that you can't talk to. Yeah, I know that was one of the big things when we did CERT way back towards the end of our, our CERT instruction, they started talking about Aries and what an amazing job Aries does and stuff like that. I mean, that was FEMA talking. So yeah, yeah it's not hard to prove how critical ham becomes in emergency situations, either for government emergency response or for individual communication in a disaster situation. Absolutely. You brought up the, the four-lettered F word that we all fear and hate and distrust, FEMA. Oh, yeah, yeah. Death <laughs> camps. Death camps are coming, man. Yeah, well, here's the thing. If you are a firm believer that FEMA is bad and you're a believer that you should keep your friends close and your enemies closer, as an Aries volunteer, mm -hmm. you work hand-in-hand -hand with FEMA and you'll know everything that's going on. There you go. Tin foil hats on tight. Tin foil hats. There you go. That's the way it is. Uh, and, and all joking aside, I know about things when things get, get ugly. I know about things sooner via radio than I do. And I'm not talking like there's an accident down the road, although that does happen. Mm -hmm. But whenever there's, uh, whenever there's FEMA trucks rolling, turn on the radio. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're doing it. You'll hear a lot of times what's going on. The Aries group's getting ready. to. They're going to be posting folks here and here for uh, a drill they're doing. At least twice a year, we do a nuclear drill for the, the nuclear power plant. And our Aries groups get together, and we all get on the radio. Mm -hmm. And all, all, of the, all of the counties in the state actually link up via ham radio to make sure that they can talk to the state capitol. Oh, so that's even, really the, cool. even the government's using it. Mm -hmm. It's out there. No one knows it's happening, but it's there. It's one more, one more way if you're a volunteer for the Aries groups or the Racies or the Skywarn, contribute to your, your community. I like that part of it. Mm -hmm. P being part of a solution rather than a problem in a disaster Absolutely. situation. And if nothing else, you get to find out where the water stations are where they're handing out ice before everybody else. There you go. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, man, we sure appreciate having you on. And I look forward to ribbing you about getting your CHL if you'll uh, rib me about getting my general. Absolutely. I, I consider that a, a challenge accepted gladly. Awesome. So. Well, thanks again, man. And thanks for coming on and sharing so much information about ham and hopefully presenting ham in a way that I think most people will hopefully finally get why it's important, why they should uh, get involved in ham and not get uh, cranky when people tell them they should get involved in ham. I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before, before we close, I would like to say this. I probably misspoke on a couple terms. Don't hold, hold, don't hold it against me. I'm a new guy. Exactly. You, you old hams that are listening to this, one, I'm glad that you're listening to a podcast, and two, if I'm wrong, let me know in that general, that general way that you guys know you can do it. <laughs> That's what Elmers are for. Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Glad to be here, my friend. Links to resources shared today can be found at www.intherabbithole.com slash e144 plus the ability to comment on this show to either ask questions or correct us on things we totally got wrong which is totally possible and of course help us keep the lights on support the itrh show and mission by becoming part of the roving horde armada you can learn more at itrh.net about all the great benefits membership gets you Things like access to episodes the Sunday night before they air publicly, encrypted forms to connect with like-minded people privately, access to every episode ever produced by ITRH, including a special one that was never aired, a free copy of the book, Owning Your Survival, Nine Steps to Surviving, Survival and Preparedness, access to a one-hour emergency kits for bugging out and bugging in class with special downloads, just to name a few. Again, visit itrh.net for more details now. We're counting on supporting members just like you to help us keep the lights on and the mics hot. And 
We've got something special for listeners today. Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash in the rabbit hole. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or any other MP3 player. I know I've become a huge fan of Audible. It's helped me chew through a lot of the books and research I have to do through the show and a lot of just really great zombie books out there. So again, check out www.audibletrial.com slash in the rabbit hole to get your free audiobook download and 30 day free trial. And that wraps up episode 144 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound.